The death of an American ambassador as the Arab Spring threatens to turn into an autumn of discontent. We've seen rage and violence over an awful internet video. Did the administration have any sort of heads up? And this is a matter that's under investigation. They panicked. Can you speak with us briefly about the attack in Benghazi? Uh, this is not an appropriate time. We are in a stronger position today than we were four years ago. Does the Obama administration have a problem calling the threat by its name? The suggestion that anybody in my team would play politics or mislead is offensive. Could you have protected Ambassador Stevens? Special Report investigates death and deceit in Benghazi. From Washington, D.C., here is Brett Baird. It looked like this election was all about the economy. But that changed when terrorists murdered four Americans at the United States consulate in Benghazi, Libya, on the anniversary of 9-11. Americans had questions. Who did this and how? Should our government have seen it coming? Did President Obama try to hide the truth? Is this a huge scandal that exposes a failed Obama foreign policy? Or is Mitt Romney just saying it is? Tonight, we'll try to give you answers. We'll walk you step by step through the terror that unfolded that day. And we'll break down the political maneuvering that's followed. But we begin with a series of frightening developments and troubling decisions leading up to that horrific night in Benghazi. It's a story you haven't heard, told by a man who tried to prevent what happened on September 11th, 2012. Did you have a close relationship with Ambassador Stevens? I lived and worked with him for about two months when, when he came on there till the time I left, yes. No one understands more than Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Wood the full extent of the fiasco that killed Stevens. He worked closely with Stevens for six months in Libya before his violent death. A 24-year U.S. Special Forces veteran, Wood's job was to try to prevent such an attack from occurring. Is there a side of this that makes you mad? That was my first reaction when I heard that Ambassador Stevens had been killed. I was angry. Why have you come forward? I was at the hub of everything that was going on there. Some of that information needs to come forward. We begin our story, however, in the winter of 2011, a year before Wood arrives in Libya. Colonel Muammar Gaddafi is still in power in Tripoli, but rebels protected by U.S. air power are gaining control over much of Libya. February 25th, the U.S. State Department withdraws all its personnel from the capital. But six weeks later, April 5th, 2011, it sends Stevens with a 12-man team by chartered boat to Benghazi, now under rebel control. As special representative to the rebels, Stevens set up shop in the Tebesti Hotel. June 1st, 2011, a car bomb explodes in the parking lot in front of that hotel. Stevens and his team decide it's too dangerous to stay there. In August, Stevens and his team settle on a compound on the west side of the city. It was uh, uh, rented from, a, from an owner who had a nice villa there and several other outbuildings as well. But not a lot of security. Like in any residence, they're, they're not a fortress. Inside the walls are four buildings. One is essentially a large residence with a number of bedrooms in it. Another residence has a cantina where the staff eats. Just across the way is what they call their tactical operations center filled with offices for security staff, phones, and security monitors. Finally, the barracks, a small house by the main gate of the compound. It will house a Libyan security force. CERT Libya, October 20th, 2011. Colonel Gaddafi is captured and killed by rebels in his hometown. Revolutions and wars don't just end. The killing goes on. Old scores are being settled. So sometimes there was revenge killings. Uh, Things going back and forth, so there was, there was still fighting going on. With Gaddafi gone, Ambassador Stevens will spend much of his time at the main U.S. Embassy building in Tripoli. But he'll come to Benghazi often. The State Department upgrades the physical security at that property. We extended the height of the outer wall. Charlene Lamb of the State Department. Missionary concrete, barbed wire, and concertina razor wire. Finally, inside the large residence, a fortified safe haven is built. You enter through a heavy metal grill with several locks on it. Tell me about this safe haven. Simply um, bars on windows, 
far as in the war, you're just you're building a jail cell basically. And you're going to get inside, and you know, it's a delay uh, until you can get some relief uh, to get out of there. Security on the compound consists of five diplomatic security special agents and four members of the Libyan government security force called the 17th February Brigade. Former UN Ambassador John Bolton. Well, it is the responsibility of host governments to provide for security for all diplomatic establishments within their territory. But from the U.S. point of view, we have to recognize that some countries are better able to do that than others. And when you're in a high threat environment, we have to do what's necessary to protect our personnel on the ground. There is more security at what's called the Annex, a mile away. Based in Tripoli, but moving around the country, is a Department of Defense site security team. February 12, 2012, Lieutenant Colonel Wood, who joined the Utah National Guard after his two plus decades in U.S. Special Forces, arrives in Libya as the new commander of the SST. It had uh, 16 members? Yes. What exactly did they all do? The site security team was special operations uh, soldiers uh, that had extra skills and capabilities they could bring to the embassy. Could a team that small really make a difference? The caliber of individuals on, on that team were the best in the United States inventory. Yeah, they can make a difference in any firefight. The problem, however, is that SST is slated to end its tour in Libya by summer's end, and the security situation is taking an ominous turn. Spring of uh, 2012, there was an uptick in terror attacks in Libya. Um, is that right? That's true. I, I think the nature of things started to change. Uh, when, when I first got on the ground, it was a lot of lawlessness going back and forth. As things uh, progressed, the commotion settled down a little bit, but the targeted attacks seemed to pick up and they seemed to be targeting more toward Westerners. April 6, 2012, a bomb is tossed over the wall of the Benghazi compound. June 6, 2012, an IED is placed on the compound's north gate. No one is injured in either incident. That's not the case five days later. June 11, 2012. A convoy transporting Great Britain's ambassador, Sir Dominic Asquith, is ambushed in Benghazi. He isn't hurt, but two of his security aides are. Clear that was a terrorist attack. I actually uh, conducted an investigation uh, a couple of days afterwards, walked the ground, took photographs, uh, examined the vehicle. So they knew what they were doing, and it was uh, definitely an assassination attempt by skilled operators. But uh, as I could see it, uh, I could see the adversary uh, growing stronger, and, and we were the last thing on our target list. In the past year, there have been more than 230 security incidents in Libya. And what's apparent to Wood is that terrorists are working on increasingly bigger plots. I had seen uh, instances occur prior to that, uh, for example, with the other bombings. You know, I, I saw a series of things going on that it, it appeared to me that they were building toward, uh, you know, additional attacks. That's why Wood and Eric Nordstrom, the regional security officer, implored the State Department to keep Wood's SST force in Libya beyond its scheduled August departure. We weren't re requesting additional security. We were requesting to keep the security that we had, and that was being taken away. So you want to keep your team on the ground the, the team that was in place already. Yeah, and my, my team was only a small part. Um, there was MSD, State Department MSD. That stands for Mobile Security Detachment Team. A lot of those are uh, ex-Green Berets, ex-Navy SEALs, uh, excellent A-trained folks. There was three uh, MSD teams when I got on the ground there. August 5th, 2012. The State Department decides not to keep the SST in Libya, and the MSD team is being reduced as well. So who opposed the request? Charlene Lamb. She uh, denied those requests or ignored them or uh, just didn't, just didn't fill okay. them in cases. Why is, that? Why, why, why is that? Because you knew about all these other attacks that had taken place, it had been 12, 14? We had been training local Libyans and arming them well, now, for uh, almost a okay, year. Well, let me just interrupt. Why do you think this request was denied? I don't know. I really don't know. In the case of the SST, uh, that was... Uh, that was provided then by, by DOD. The State Department didn't, didn't have to pay money for that. I can't imagine why. I just, I can't fill in that blank. That, that's part of what was trying to come out in, that, in the congressional investigations. I mean, were you just 
flat flabbergasted that, like, what can we do? We couldn't even keep what we had. I think that what was motivating the State Department was that if we had security that would have truly been appropriate, it would have been an admission that conditions on the ground in Libya were not safe. And that would have violated the world view that, uh, that this had been an administration success. You left Libya in August, uh, less than a month before the attack. August 14th. How did you feel about the security situation when you left? I didn't like it. Um, and I, I, I said as much. And my concerns were specifically for Benghazi. September 10th, 2012. Ambassador Chris Stevens arrives in Benghazi for a full day of meetings beginning the next morning. His first trip there since Wood's security team left the country. Going to a dangerous place like Benghazi. Yes. But he knew it, didn't he? Yes, he knew. And he went anyway, because I think in his heart, mission came first. September 11th, 2012. A mob gathers at the U.S. Embassy in Cairo, Egypt, then scales the walls and burns the American flag. The explanation? is that they're angry over an obscure anti-Islam video produced in California. <laughs> Meanwhile, something else is going on in Benghazi. At about 5 p.m. Eastern time, the first reports about an attack come across the wire. It won't be until morning, however, until America learns how serious that is. We weren't there. We just weren't there. And if you were, could you have protected Ambassador Stevens? Well. The more guns you have in a firefight, the better chance you have of winning. When we return, Special Report Investigates is on the scene in Benghazi. What happened that night? Greg Palcott has the story of heroism and disaster. The details are still coming out about what happened in Benghazi on September 11th in off-camera briefings, in congressional hearings. Special Report has investigated as well. Greg Palcott took that information and went to Benghazi himself. There he talked to eyewitnesses and scoured the abandoned compound for additional clues. Now he pulls it all together and walks you through a timeline of terror you won't soon forget. September 11th, 2012, morning. The U.S. Ambassador to Libya, Chris Stevens, has a full day of meetings ahead of him. But since it's the 11th anniversary of the Al-Qaeda attacks, he schedules all of them out of caution behind the perceived safety of the U.S. mission walls in Benghazi. 7.30 p.m., Stevens takes his last meeting in the large residence building with the Turkish Consul General. It ends after an hour. 8.30 p.m., Stevens escorts the diplomat to the main gate. He makes small talk in Arabic to the guards and returns inside. At this point, outside the main gate of the compound, on the other side of the U.S. mission walls in this Benghazi neighborhood, all is quiet. No stirrings of any protest, no sign of the real hell about to unfold. In fact, the ambassador decides to turn in for the night. 9 p.m., still no sign of any kind of spontaneous demonstration over that web video. A protest the Obama administration would later suggest escalated into a deadly riot. Joining Stevens in the main residence building is Information Management Officer Sean Smith and four Diplomatic Security Special Agents. Another agent is at the nearby Tactical Operations Center. All these agents are armed with pistols. 9.40 p.m. This amateur video apparently captures the first movement outside the compound. The mad mob of attackers break through here, the main gate, a weak point in the defense of the mission. And then they move on here to the understaffed Libya militia barracks. They storm the place, they torch it, they light up embassy cars around it, and then they move on. According to eyewitnesses, the fighters are well armed and organized, flying the radical Islamist flag, some with foreign accents. The agent in the operations center sees in monitors scores of men pouring into the compound. A diplomatic security agent working in the tactical operations center